Hello, it's me, Sam Baker. And before we go on with the show, I want to tell you about an exciting new initiative coming from The Shift. Many of you have asked how you can support the podcast further and get more Shift into the bargain. Well, now you have the opportunity to do just that by joining The Shift community. You can go to steady.media forward slash The Shift and become a member of The Shift. In return for supporting the podcast, you'll receive exclusive weekly newsletters, community membership, and plenty of other perks aimed at bringing us all closer together. That's steady.media forward slash the shift. Hello and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no-holds-barred truth about being a woman post-40. Created and hosted by me, writer and broadcaster, Sam Baker. I can't remember the first time I met my friend Claire Grogan, but like many Gen Xers, I do remember the first time I saw her in the cult movie Gregory's Girl. And then later that same year, on top of the pops, with altered images, performing the band's top 10 hits, Happy Birthday and I Could Be Happy. Still in her teens, she was living a life the rest of us could only dream of. Until at 25, with three top 10 albums under her belt, she left it all behind so she could, as she puts it, feel where I came from again. Since then, she's had countless presenting and acting roles in everything from EastEnders to Skins. And now, 38 years after her last album, she's back with a new Altered Images album, Mascara Streaks. You know, I kept on saying to my sisters, this is really annoying because all this shit is getting in the way of me having a good time. (laughs) Claire zoomed in to talk about deciding where you want to go in life doing every show like it might be your last, and being back on the road at 60. We discussed the unexpected impact of her daughter hitting the age she was when altered images hit the big time, her difficult 40s, and why it's never too late to start a band. Well, thank you for coming on The Shift, Claire. Thank you for having me, Sam. I was going to say you're back. You're not back because you never went away. But before we go back, let's start by talking about mascara streaks and why now? I think like a lot of sort of creative people that found themselves with this sudden halt in all proceedings. Yeah. I mean, I was actually in Scotland at Pitlochry. Uh, I just opened in Barefoot in the Park and was transferring to the Lyceum. We opened on the Saturday and closed on the Monday that oh, March of 2020. And I honestly, at the time, it was disappointing but I was saying to the cast and the director and everyone listen see in a couple of months I really honestly thought we'd pick up from there (laughs) of course how wrong was I (laughs) so you know that first lockdown Sam I have to say I really enjoyed being at home um, and not on the move because quite often I'm on the move so that was really lovely and you know, I did just kind of relax into it quite quickly. I was quite surprised and it, it really cleared my head. I mean, once I'd watched every, you know, box set known to man, I suddenly went, well, I've got some space in my head to think about where I want to go with what I'm doing in life. Because sometimes you don't even realise you're you're caught up in a sort of pattern that there's nothing wrong with it. But when you have the chance to slightly reflect on it, and go, maybe I really need to shake things up a bit. So I suddenly became, in the second lockdown, totally overwhelmed and and compelled, in fact, to to start writing songs again um, on a kind of obsessive level, which just took me by surprise. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, I think it was was just a very long-winded story that I I just suddenly found the headspace. Because like when you were saying about how you were always on the move, I was thinking that, you know, on the move, it does feel like who you are, you know, that kind of always doing stuff, doing a bit of this and a bit of that and busy. And so was it a bit of a shock to not be? Yeah, but it ended up being a pleasant surprise. I mean, I am an absolute nomad at heart. I realise that about myself. And and do you know what it is? I honestly never really view myself as a competitive person, Sam, and I really genuinely don't. So one of the great things about that first lockdown was, you know, all my contemporaries, no one was able to do anything. (laughs) So I felt very secure in the knowledge (laughs) that I'm not the only one not working. (laughs) 
<laughs> and that kind of took me by surprise as well because I don't really view myself like that. So I learned a lot about myself. I thought, this is okay. But the minute people started working again and doing things, I was like, okay, I have to, I have to, you know, at least attempt to get back to what I've been doing. And of course, there were so many false starts with all of that, Sam, you know, so many shows that we tried to make work that you couldn't make work. I mean, I think as our industry really, really suffered and it's still suffering. And I find that really upsetting. You've managed to get back out touring, haven't you? Yes. I did a a Narina tour um, last December with the Human League um, opening for them. And that was amazing fun. I can't tell you. But at that point, we were in a bubble. So I did this massive, big, exciting tour with a band I've known for a very long time and admired forever. And I was never in the same room as them at the same time throughout that tour because we all decided to, yeah, we stayed in our bubbles. And at first it was quite weird. And then it just seemed absolutely the right thing to do. We wanted to protect Phil for the most in, in many ways, you know, and and the rest of the Human League. And because there was so much at stake and a lot of the big tours at that point were going out in a bit of a limb because there was no insurance for this if anyone got COVID. You know, we were all stuffed if that happened. Oh, God. So, Yeah. It was, it's completely mental and it still is a bit, but, you know, first it seemed quite weird. And then my band and myself, we just ended up having an absolute laugh. We really did because we had to. And it was a kind of real bonding experience as well for us. That was great. And then I've just, I did a tour in March and April, which went really well, sold out most places. And over the summer, I'll be doing festivals and then, um, playing the liquid rooms in September, I think. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. I just didn't expect this to happen the way it has. I really didn't. Do you still get a massive kick out of it? Huge. You, you <laughs> look like you do when you're on stage. You always look like you're having the best time. Well, when I, I say to people, I actually almost do every show like it might be my last opportunity. And I don't mean that in a sort of, you know, a gloomy way, but that is what the pandemic taught me. It was a bit like anything could happen to make this not happen, you know? So um I just decided I was going to really enjoy it and also the absolute commitment of people that came back you know who were willing to put whatever kind of concerns they had about being in a room with lots of people you know I just think you know they've made this decision and we are going to go on that stage and and make them not regret it. What do you think, um, you know, 18, 19 year old you who was like catapulted to fame? What do you think she would would think of, oh, my God, 60 year old Claire giving it a role on the stage now? I think she would have thought it was fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe not quite right. <laughs> um, what, indecorous, then- you mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like. What are you thinking? I mean, I, I actually remember when I first got asked back to, to perform Altered Images songs again. It was in 2002. And at that point, I was still in my 40s. And I thought, I'm not sure if this is going to work for me in my 40s. I don't know if it's... And um, But anyway, I did do it. And I loved it. And it's it's just gone from there. You know, it's... It, it really is. I mean, but I did genuinely have to have my arm twisted a bit back in 2002. And I'm glad that I, I did have that, you know, that I was pushed into it slightly because it's been a really, really great experience. Did you find that like your 40s were maybe a decade where you worried more about that stuff? That kind of in your 40s, you might have been like, oh, that is that thing I want to do. That's not very cool. Whereas once I felt like once I got into my 50s, I stopped giving a shit about all of that. and just (laughs) did what I wanted to do and what I enjoyed. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a really good point, Sam. I think there there was a huge element now of me thinking I'm not the least bit over concerned about how people view this now. But I think, you know, you and I were, you know, we knew each other back then. And I think it's kind of quite well known 
the difficulties I had in terms of my fertility and, Mm. you know, wanting to be a mum. And I managed that at 43. So to a certain extent, I think it suddenly made me feel, uh, for Ellie's sake, it made me want to hang on to the kind of youthful exuberance of what being in a band gives to you in life. And I wanted Ellie to see me as that person, I suppose. You know, I mean, Mm. that was going on subconsciously. So, you know, it was just like, it would be a shame if Ellie had never known me as this performing, singing person. And I just thought it would be really nice for her to see that. Does that make any sense? I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, totally. It totally does. I mean, is Ellie, how old is Ellie? She's 16 now. 17. She's going to be 18 in December. Oh, yeah. holy shit. Act, when we moved, um, I found a picture of her in our kitchen drawer and she must have been <laughs> one. Because I, I always remember this. Um, I'm pretty sure in red you did a, a freebie of a sarong, a kind of yes. wraparound. Yes, it was wearing a sarong, yes. Yeah. Yes. And Ellie, who I could barely get to wear clothes because she was just one of those kids that overheated all the time. But she, I, one day I wrapped that sarong around her and she loved it. <laughs> and she wore it nonstop for like the, a whole summer. <laughs> so thank you. Oh, excellent I managed value. To get <laughs> managed to barely wear clothes. <laughs> yeah, she's, I mean, she's a fabulous girl. I'm a bit biased, but yeah. Oh. I mean, like you said, you wanted to perform because you wanted her to know that you. But has her becoming a teenager and kind of hitting the age that you were at when you were first in auto images, has, has that kind of affected you, do you think? Hugely. I mean, I think that's a big part of um, the whole Mascara Streep thing. You know, um, for the album, for a lot of the songs, I sort of revisited songs that I was listening to at that age. And also I couldn't get over that being that age and being so restricted in terms of what you could do and where you could go. I just thought this is so tough. And our our young people, I've, I've felt that hugely. But it also took me back to thinking when I was Ellie's age, I was literally in the back of a transit van running around the country, you know, doing John Peel sessions and playing festivals and And it just struck me how vulnerable I was. And that's the thing that I've thought about a lot, that when I look at Ellie and she's, I mean, she's, you know, she's a fairly together girl. And and so was I to a certain extent, but also, you know, just through the course of, you know, being interviewed and talking about myself, you know, which I love, <laughs> which, which is helpful. Yeah. Um, not really. No, I <laughs> but, can see um, from your face you don't love it. <laughs> so I, I did a thing, actually, it was with um, Dame Denise Mina, and it was about looking back at my younger self. And, you know, it was meant to be a sort of celebratory thing. And it was, but also I was really struck by how naive I was and you know this is not a blame thing or anything it was just uh, you know it was just the times really but I I realized that I was just very exposed without real proper advice and support and you were you were the only girl in the band were you the only girl in the whole entourage yeah I mean that 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 was it really Sam and you know these um boys that I hung around with and you know had fun on stage with you know, I mean, they were my age as well. And so all of us were just finding our way to who we were in life, you know. But I, I I, do think that for me, it became a very lonely place. It really did. I think it's changed now. I think that that's probably why I have girls in my band now as well. You know, just looking back, I think a lot of this stuff is quite subconscious. But I do think that, you know, it's quite tough being the only girl in this incredibly male-dominated environment. I mean, a lot of the time I just felt like a bit of a pest. Yeah, I mean, that's when I when I interviewed Tracy Thorne for this podcast. She was she said the same kind of thing. It was like that constant, oh, you're you're a girl, you can't carry that, you can't move that, you don't know how that works, you're, you know, just a, a bit yeah. other. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, and at the time, I suppose, I just got on with it because that's what you did, you know. And But I, I, I really do ha- remember having moments where, and of course the big moment was when I left the band where I just thought, I cannot do this anymore. I just can't. I can't that was do that. An amazing thing to do <laughs> at 20, what were you, 25, 24? Mm, yeah, around that age, yeah. Um, and I just I went home to Scotland to make Comfort and Joy with Bill Forsyth. And once again found myself in Glasgow living at home with my mum and dad for a couple of months while I made the film. And I just really felt secure and appreciated. Um, in a way and I thought maybe I just have had enough of this wandering around the world you know <laughs> of course I probably just needed a really good holiday son yeah I probably just needed to lie down <laughs> yeah was it a thing that felt fabulous and then stopped feeling fabulous or did it always yeah. feel a bit uncomfortable no I mean I say this all the time it was really great till it wasn't <laughs> mm. And I don't know what, well, I grew up a bit, I suppose. And um, I think that, yeah, I was just exhausted, you know, just, and and the responsibility of trying to keep this band in the limelight, I suddenly went, I, I can't do this anymore. As I've just said, like, maybe I just needed a six month break. Um, but, you know, when you're young, everything's so black and white. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Are you always, <laughs> it's this or this. <laughs> yeah, I can't. It's not like I'm just going to sit down for a bit. It's like it's all mm. going or it's all <laughs> staying. Yeah. Because you had that like total crazy level of fame that you got from Gregory's Girl as well, which was like one of those films and is still one of those films. I mean, what impact do you think that had? Because you like literally went from playing with your band to two top 10 hits and... Gregory's Girl in one year, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, the summer I left school, I got signed to a major record label and made Gregory's Girl. And I think that I thought, well, this is all rather convenient because I, I really did want to be a pop star and a film star. This yeah. works. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm Job clueless. done. Yeah. Totally clueless. I just thought my life would continue like that. And um, I'll never understand that double whammy. I, that, you know, I call it the double whammy. I really don't get it. But I just I just took it in my stride because I didn't know how else to react. So, you know, it was just... And everyone around me was so encouraging and so great to be around. And I thought, you know, I, I probably didn't overthink it. I just did it. But I do remember one day being at home and the phone going my mum called me downstairs and I picked up the phone and it was my press officer at the record label and he went I just read that you were in a film that's won a BAFTA and I went yes (laughs) (laughs) and and and, yeah and yeah (laughs) he's like when were you going to mention this to me it just it didn't even occur to me to mention it to the record label that was in a film (laughs) what is that I mean everything's so different now as you know only too well Sam you know, everything mm-hmm. is a machine. Everyone's, you know, like working towards something. I mean, it wouldn't happen now. Um, but it, it does make me laugh. It really does. Um, you know, and, and once the news was out there, um, before I knew it, I was in the States um, touring and promoting Gregory's Girl with Gordon. And I mean, I've told this story so many times, Sam, but we'd honestly arrived at some you know, American TV breakfast show. And, um, you know, the first time it happened, they said, yeah, we have two two of the UK's top young stars coming up next. And Gordon and I would honestly be looking around thinking, <laughs> who's going to be on? <laughs> Who are we going to meet? And then we realised it was us they were talking about. <laughs> it's just, we really, I mean, we had a ball. We really did. And I'm kind of glad we didn't take it too seriously. I, I really am glad. Because I think if we'd allowed ourselves to feel the pressure at that point, we'd have been stuffed. But we didn't. We were just too excited about getting to drink martinis. And yeah, on someone else's tab. Yeah, yeah and stay in fabulous hotels. <laughs> that was such a weird thing, wasn't it? It's not just fame. It's like a... 
it's like a crazy level of fame. I mean, before we came on, I was, um, I thought, well, just because you know it doesn't mean you can't do any research. So I was, I was Googling away, Googling away to see what I didn't know about you. And there were just loads, particularly in the Scottish press, there's absolutely loads and loads of headlines still now that are all about Gregory's Girl in relation to you. And there was one I saw which said, Gregory's Girl star Claire Grogan looks unrecognisable 42 years after film debut. It's like, uh, no shit. It's <laughs> so weird. Sometimes, does it feel like um, a kind of a thing on your shoulder a bit? No. And it, I mean... <laughs> It really doesn't. And I, I tell you why. I I honestly don't think I'd even be sitting having this conversation with you now, Sam, if it wasn't for that film. And sometimes I think that that film has slightly obscured all the other stuff that I've done. I've just had to go, that's OK, because the level of love and appreciation for Gregory's Girl is something that most performers never get the chance to experience. So I just, I feel really, really touched by what it means to people still. I really do. I saw it for the first time, um, maybe, I can't remember how long ago it was, it was just pre-pandemic anyway, but no, maybe about five years ago and the British Film Institute, um, the BFI, had a, a, a screening of it and they invited me and Gordon and Dee and I thought this might be my last chance to see it on a big screen and I thought because Ellie was old enough to actually kind of get it a bit, I thought this is going to be so lovely if I couldn't see this for the first time with my own daughter. So you'd <laughs> never seen it before? Not in its entirety. I mean I'd been to lots of like various screenings and premieres but you kind of watch the first 15 minutes and you leave. Yeah, then you, you still up, yeah. Yeah, so um, Stephen, my husband, who you know, um, came as well and Gordon was there with his wife Shona who's a really good friend of mine and his kids and uh, Dee was there with her big kids and we were in their like biggest auditorium it was sold out and to be in that room with everyone around me laughing their heads off you know was it was it was really special yeah I'm so glad I went (laughs) did you feel like you knew that girl you know I think essentially I am the same person I really do I mean, obviously you evolve and you handle things. And I've had a lot to handle in life, Sam, as Mm. you know. But I think that deep down inside, I Mm. am still that kind of slightly crazy show off at heart. (laughs) (laughs) Because like you said, you did have um, a tough time having IVF before you got Ellie. And um, and then your mum died and your dad had dementia, didn't he? I mean, do you feel like now... That's in the past. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but is there a sense a sort of liberation now? I wish I could say there was, but I think that, you know, um, you know, as you know, Stephen had cancer as well. Mm. So, you know, what I really, really learned in life is you really can't take anything for granted. That a lot of my joy in life has come from bleakness at times you know it's like you sink or swim you know and I have had a lot of varied incredibly difficult situations to deal with as most of us have as adults and you know I kept on saying to my sisters this is really annoying because all this shit is getting in the way of me having a good time (laughs) (laughs) but I was just kind of joking my way through it and I had to, you know, I had, you know, almost 10 years of tragedy and disaster to deal with. And I've come out of it on a level by learning to put that difficult stuff somewhere else so I can get on with the things I like doing and enjoying my life, even when circumstances get tough. And I honestly don't know how I've managed that. Resilience, I guess. Yeah. And I was thinking, when I was thinking about the fact that you did leave Altered Images when you were in your early 20s, for all the reasons <laughs> that we've discussed, which I know, thinking about it now, it's like, whoa, that's just, that was just like mad. But it seems like, and I've probably, I don't know, like, I guess I've maybe known you about 20 years, I think, I guess. Yeah. And you do have like, the most incredibly strong sense of self 
like you to from outside I mean obviously I don't know how like little Claire feels inside but I wondered if that came from your family because you've always been really close to them haven't you and really grounded in Glasgow yeah I think that and and going back to I think when I left Altered Images I think one of the other big things was I realized I'd lost my sense of self and it's so important. And I don't even know what that is necessarily, but you just, I think the absolutely beauty of my mum and dad were, I was a bit out there, Sam. I didn't realise how out there I was until I looked back on it. And I probably still am a bit. <laughs> but my mum and dad let me be myself. And, you know, they were quite, I've talked to you, directly about this before I mean they were actually strict Catholics um you know they had a very high standard of what they expected in terms of my sisters and I's behavior but they also allowed us the freedom to explore a little bit of who we wanted to be in life and in my case you know I've said to my parents how and why on earth did you let me do that and you know because I would literally just get into the back of a van with a bunch of boys that they vaguely knew but you know they they liked and you know go drive down to London do a John Peel session and drive back the next day and go to school and I mean I I look at Ellie and she asked I'm like no (laughs) that's not gonna happen so I I remind myself of my parenting my parents parenting a lot with Ellie because I think you know they just allowed me to make my own mistakes to a certain extent as well but you know they just they also said to me it would it would have been so much worse if we tried to stop you Claire then wrong I just, yeah and they, they just had that amazing sense of what was going to work for me in life before I even knew. And they really, it's, they didn't, it's not like they really encouraged me. Yeah. <laughs> like pushy showbiz parents in the least. No, the opposite, very opposite yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah. But they, they allowed me to do it at an age where some parents would have just put their foot down. And I'm so glad for them in my life, I really am. Well, you weren't a stage school brat, were you? You were like a indie kid, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I was in the Scottish Youth Theatre and I absolutely loved it. But, you know, I was just, you know, the minute the sort of, you know, I was a wee bit too young to be a proper punk, but I was witnessing this and thinking, I get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is me. This is my identity. And then, you know, the whole post-punk thing as well. I mean, you know, I, I loved Susie Sue and Polystyrene and Debbie Harry. They were my kind of girls. And I, it was just a joy to to witness them being big and bold and and being on top of the pops. You know? yeah. <laughs> I loved it. And I and then I joined them quite quickly and I, once again, I don't know how that happened. Well, I I saw you because I always thought of you as as like kind of punky, soft punky. When I was so you know, when I was not very much younger than you, but felt like worlds away. And watching you on the telly and watching Gregory's girl, thinking, oh wow, she's got the best life. This is in- incredible. And then I saw on social media, I saw some bloke describe you as the original manic pixie dream girl Uh which was like it was kind of the opposite of what I saw when I looked at that Claire yeah it's kind of so weird because you never to me you never fit that box yeah I mean I did get labeled the pixie of pop quite a lot in the newspaper headlines as well and I think it's it was definitely down to my 
stature really my size because you're little yeah (laughs) (laughs) they're so unimaginative aren't they yeah and you know it never really bothered me but then I mean I just got ended up getting pulled in so many different directions and it just eventually it just exhausts you you know it's like you can't get it right for getting it wrong Mm. and I allowed myself to maybe pay too much attention to that you know at certain points and it's hard not to it's really hard not to take on board everyone's particular take on you you know when you're young Mm. and you don't have the you, you you just don't have the confidence to go, well, that's not how I see it, you know. Um, and, you know, I, was, I started off quite bullshy. I really did, Sam. Well, that's how was... I think of you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I from knowing you, but also from watching you when I was a kid, you know. You know, I mean, I, I was a girl with attitude, you know, the, you know, sticking my tongue out, crossing my eyes on top of the pops, you know, just... I couldn't quite, I kind of loved the contradiction, I suppose, you know, of, and even in my songwriting, I think on the surface, a lot of my songs seem really up and fun and jolly, but there's a really little dark undercurrent going on underneath it, which only I will know. (laughs) And I kind of like that. I really do. I was listening this morning to I Could Be Happy. Mm. Um, which I always loved. I think it's always my favorite. And I was really listening to the lyrics, which is a very long time since I've had, I have. It's not, it's, it's not cheery. <laughs> it's not a perky song. I love it. It's my favorite for all sorts of reasons. Some of them quite dark, but it's, it's not perky. It's not a pixie song. You know, it, it really is. And, and it's a song that gives people a huge amount of joy. And I love that. You know, I really don't want to take that joy away. Um, sorry, Sam. Just, I need a new. Um, all right, okay. I just need to put this in. Um, all my electronic stuff is all. You know, it has a kind of sell by date. This Mac stuff and everything's kind of. It's all gone through it. Yeah, always the same. <laughs> yeah, um, but you know, I, I, I. I very rarely, pardon me, talk about my song lyrics because I like people to take whatever they want from them. But yeah, I mean, a lot of my songs are about escaping something. (laughs) You know, and I, yeah, I, 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 I kind of know where it comes from. But I find it quite difficult to talk about still, you know. Um, And, you know, maybe one day I'll be ready to really talk about it. I just haven't found that moment yet. Fair enough. Um, And how, when you were writing the songs for Mascara Streaks, how did you think that age and experience, because it's how long, is it 37 years since you've done an album or did I make that up? No, it's about 30, it could be 38 now. I recorded it for, and now it's coming out 38 years, I think, after my last. Yeah, it's mental. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how was it? How was songwriting after that big gap? How different was it with the age and experience and the tough times under your belt? Well, I mean, I have kind of dabbled in songwriting over the years, Um with you know, I wrote some stuff for skins when I was in it, and um, they used one of them, which was great. Um, and with Stephen as well, you know, he worked in the States for a long time, and I'd go over there and I would do some songwriting projects with him and American artists. So, I mean, I, I kept dabbling in it, but what was different about this is I just had this very clear idea about what I was trying to across and say and maybe that's the first time that's ever happened to me as a songwriter and I think it has come with just my life experience and 
themes that I've been carrying around with me for a very, very long time. And I just kept on thinking about those big, crazy nights out that we all have when, you know, particularly when we're young and the intense drama attached to it, <laughs> you know, like the anticipation of going out, the getting ready, the starting off, everyone's, it's all great. At some point, it's going to take an absolute dive. There's going to be a drama. <laughs> There's going to be crying. There's possibly going to be throwing up, you know, um, and then everyone calms down again and it's all sort of okay. And then you somehow find your way home to get straight on the phone to your friends to talk about the crazy night out. Then you eventually wake up in the morning and that's where the Mascara Street Slim comes from. But I just thought it was such a metaphor for life. <laughs> <laughs> Totally, I really yeah. thought night, all those crazy big night outs where we're preparing us for life. Yeah. And, you know, for the I'm big come down afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it it's everything, you know, in one evening. And the intensity of that. And I just love that as a theme. And I just kept on building on that and about how lucky I was and how lucky Ellie is to a certain extent extent she might not totally feel I can't speak for her but what I certainly hope Stephen and I have done is created a really safe place for her so that she'll always want to come home and that's what my parents did for me they created a an environment where I knew no matter what shit I was in I could go home and I think that is so important and it saddens me enormously that some people don't have that in life. I really, I feel so lucky. I think it takes quite a long time, doesn't it, for you to really get that, to appreciate how important that is. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I suppose you kind of know it, but don't really have a full appreciation of what that is and what that means to have and yeah I just you know home it's a track that I we've, I wrote with Bernard Butler and Robert Hodges or I always call him Robert but most people know him as Bobby Bluebell and yes, Stephen yeah. it's the only track the four of us wrote together and I just and we had such a laugh writing it together it was like enormous fun but I, I love the song because it is just, it's quite joyful and euphoric, even although it comes from, you know, when things don't go the way you want them to. Um, just knowing that you you can go home. <laughs> that place, that safe environment exists for you in life. That's and it, you don't need to have the mum and dad attached, just knowing you've got somewhere good to go. Yeah, a, a safe place. Yeah. Uh, has that, you know, working with, like, working with Bernard Butler and different people and just really, like, flexing your creative muscles, has that has that kind of wet your appetite for, for more now? Completely and absolutely. I mean, I, I honestly love the fact that I've, I've got, a two album deal <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I'm so enjoying the process of all this again I really am and also I've got an incredibly supportive team around me who are just um you know just ready to catch me if I fall and that's so important in life and you know exposing myself on this level at this point in my life is terrifying Sam I have to say but Nothing could stop me from doing it. I just feel absolutely compelled to see this through and make the most of it. Um, and I, you know, for me, I'm already in a win win situation. I made an album I love with people I love. So that was it. That's it. You know, I've done that. And what happens next with it, I'm certainly going to, you know, do my best to spread the word. Um, I really am and hope people love it but 
you know, people's reactions to it, I can't control. So I'm just hoping that people get it. <laughs> and if they don't, fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> you will, have, so you reformed or rebuilt really the band, didn't you, for touring? Well, I mean, I think I have to really clarify that. I mean, the, the great thing is, um, I mean, I have been performing for a long time with a sort of, I call them a cooperative of musicians. They're all, for the most, Glasgow-based, um, which became this just really lovely, convenient thing because I was up and down seeing my dad all the time. And I, was, I just kept on meeting really lovely Scottish musicians. So, um, you know... I think that, you know, every time I play live, you can see quite a different lineup. And um, it just depends. I've got a pool of about 10 people that I use, and they are all involved in other things. And so not so it's all about availability, but they're all great. And you know, we all work well together. My dream is to get us all on stage at the same time, <laughs> uh, which I'm sure I'll pull off at some point. But th that's how it worked. And it's, it, you know, there was, I know it sounds, I, I mean, you know me and I've said this in the past, but I have never had a master plan. I have never set out to do something and had like, this is how it's going to work notes. So for me, it's all about how things have evolved. So when I got asked back in 2002 to go on tour with the Human League, funnily enough, um, and Kim Wilde, I, I just in the end couldn't resist the you know and all my friends and family were going you know we've got we really want to meet Phil Oakey yeah you you've got to do it. it I had yeah. there back in 1984 you've got to do it oh 82 god <laughs> so that, it, that's how it kind of re-emerged again for me and then it went really well and from there I've just been asked to do more and more and more um so I, I've just created a a, a bunch of musicians around me um who, who who do the shows with me and they're all fabulous and and great fun but you know there was no there I mean I'm just a hard worker Sam that's the other mm -hmm. thing and I think that's what people sort of underestimate and that's actually what I'm really enjoying about that series hacks it's just like, yeah. yeah she's just like she's up at five a.m she's I mean, no one can keep that up forever. But if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it the best I can. And um, and having, I suppose, having this, this, you know, the young ones around me, quite often I'm the one going, well, come on! <laughs> yeah. Let's do this! <laughs> <laughs> They're all, like, on their phones looking at going, yeah, Claire, could you calm down just a little bit? <laughs> no, never! <laughs> so yeah I don't know I think yeah I try not to overanalyze myself too much <laughs> my best like you've just had a big birthday mm -hmm. have you felt any pressure because you live quite a public life but has that impacted on how you feel about aging have you felt any pressure about it I mean you're looking bloody fantastic as usual thank you um you know I think probably yes I mean I didn't think I would mind turning 60 at all until about two weeks before it. And I was like, I can't, I couldn't even say the number. And this is interesting because I view people as people genuinely so. I don't view them as an age. Mm. I don't think because you're a certain age, you should be doing certain things at a certain point in your life. I genuinely don't. But turning 60 definitely tripped me up a little bit. And then I got over it. I just decided, you know, Claire, I never, I honestly, Sam, never viewed my mum and dad as being old. I just viewed them as being pat and patty. We come from quite an inclusive family. So it's like, we're all doing things together. It was never like the kids over here and the parents over there. Sometimes I am a bit like this. I would use kids all go over there. Yeah, <laughs> go away. Yeah, yeah go away, you know. Yeah. But for the most 
you know, when we had parties at home, it was all generations. And I think that has left a bit of a mark on me. I, I really do. And it's not because I'm desperately trying to cling on to my youth. It's not about that. It's about allowing myself to be whoever I want to be at this point in my life. And I don't view myself as old. I just don't. You're not. I view myself as a lot of other things. <laughs> <laughs> that I won't go into. Yeah. But I just, I, I just don't see it like that. I really don't. I don't think sixty is old anyway. I genuinely don't. I know that I might be totally deluded, but I, I think we live in a world now where we need to keep challenging what people expect of people at various points in their life. You know, I'm not going to go away quietly because maybe some people think that's what you should do at a certain point. I don't know. What, what do you think, Sam? Tell me your thoughts on this. Well, no, I agree. I just think that, I mean, that's part of the reason I started the podcast, because I'm just not going anywhere quietly or otherwise. But I did feel like I just wasn't hearing so much from older women as I wanted to. You know, the, yeah. the women I knew, like you and like loads of other people, were all doing as much as ever. Mm. But it wasn't getting any airtime. Like you say, 60 isn't old. I mean, like even 70 isn't anymore I mean <laughs> like the physical kind of things that might like get in uh-huh. the way I don't know about you but when I get up from this chair I will definitely creak and that's a, a bit shitty but <laughs> you know apart from that I just feel like I've got as much energy and stuff as ever I think there are people who don't want to see it but that's not my problem you know I had such a great compliment from Caroline Guthrie who was also in Gregory's Girl and Caroline and I see each other from time to time and she's a wonderful woman she's a great actress as well but she came to see me in Glasgow when I was opening for the Human League and I couldn't see her because of the whole keeping in the bubble thing no bubble thing but she sent me a text saying you've made me want to start a band (laughs) <laughs> oh, oh my god that's so brilliant and I just thought great do it <laughs> yeah you can go around the country with the mascara streaks album making middle-aged women want to start bands that's that's a big, <laughs> big achievement yeah I love that I really did I, I'm gonna ask you the questions I always ask mm-hmm. what's your emotional age you know I'm not trying to be difficult so. <laughs> yeah, as if I just don't know what that would be I don't know what the answer to that would be my emotional age is whatever age I am well it's like it's interesting isn't it because I think on the one hand you're from outside you're very very youthful on the other hand like you've lived through a lot of shit Mm. so a youthful 60 (laughs) (laughs) stop mentioning 60 all right a youthful youthful (laughs) (laughs) I just, I honestly, you don't think you'll mind being 60 until you are. <laughs> oh, do you know what? I think I have got to a point where I really love being in my 50s. Yeah, I, I, I did as well. 60 is a big yeah. number, isn't it? It is a big number. <laughs> you enjoy your 50s. <laughs> but no, I, I mean, honestly, I don't know what my emotional age would be. I really don't. I have dealt with a lot. I'm proud of what I've dealt with in life because I think I've handled it all in a really composed way for most of it and at times that was really difficult but when you're the one that has to deal with it because there's no one else that's going to then you just have to find that in yourself and I think that I had to find that and I did again and again and again so I don't know what that says I'm probably emotionally worn out (laughs) (laughs) let's call it resilient instead (laughs) As opposed yeah. to emotionally knackered. It's like, <laughs> give us a book recommendation. God, these are, this is so hard. And, and actually, it's funny the way this conversation has gone, because um, in the end, I was given this book by my big sister, and it kind of absolutely ties in with everything we've been talking about. And it's called A Manual for Heartache. How to Feel Better by Kathy Retzenbrink. Oh, yes. Oh, she'll be so happy. Oh, <laughs> do you know, I have it at the side of my bed. I love fiction. I really do, as you know. So I very rarely read sort of self-help type books. But this is a book. I keep it on my bedside table. I'm in my bedroom at the moment, so. And mm-hmm. quite often I'll just, I'll literally just open a page and start reading it. And there's always something in there that I can absolutely relate to. And it's a book that I've passed on to others so many times. 
So yeah, that would be my big recommendation. Yeah. Oh, that is going to make her really, really happy. Uh, do you, is she a friend of yours? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I might text her afterwards and tell her. What advice would you give younger women? Work hard because you get there in the end. I, I mean, you really do. I, I know that sounds really simplistic, but it, I, I suppose it's don't give up. You know, because I have had moments in my career where I've just thought, what am I doing? But there was something in me that held on to that original dream that I had in life, to be a, an actor and a singer. And I've just always found that thought in my head and that desire again. And it is that sense of self. It is about remember who you were when you started this and and just find that passion again. And it can be in anything. It's not, I don't think everyone needs to conquer the fucking world. Mm -hmm. I really don't. But I do think keeping engaged um, and curious and not taking anything for granted, you know, and that's really hard when you're young because you you do, you take it all for granted. You learn not to do. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I ramble. No, you don't. No, it's interesting. Who's your old bird role model? Well, you see, if I admire a woman for their longevity, creativity, um, resilience, I would never refer to them as an old bird. It's just not an expression I would use. Who's Um, your role model? Thank you. Uh, (laughs) Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi. Pelosi. Um, Yeah. You know, it's not like I know, I've not got some kind of encyclopedic knowledge of the woman, but there's something about her where I just, if I see her on TV, I can't help but stop and listen to her and think, you're right. And the struggle that she must have experienced to become, you know, the first female Speaker of the House of Representatives, I can't even imagine what, how hard she's worked. And not only does she work really hard, she looks fabulous. You know, and there's something about those, my mum and her sisters who were always a bit, really had a touch of the Jackie Onassis about them. You yes. know, they were working class women who you know, would get down on their own hands and knees and scrub their kitchen floors and all the rest of it. But when they went out in public, they were super dashing, you know. And that's what I love about Nancy. She just kind of reminds me of a lot of women that I know that are just taking care of themselves and making a mark and making a point. And you can be a mum doing that. You can be anything. You know, it's not about big career moments. It's just about, even although, my God, she's got an enormous career, but I just love that sense of every day I'm going to get up and put myself out there and there's going to be a ton of shite to deal with, but I'm (laughs) going to keep doing it, you know. I love that. (laughs) What's your superpower? The ability to draw a line. (laughs) I'm very good at going, tomorrow's another day. And I've learned that. And I think that is a bit of a superpower. I'm not someone that carries things around with me. I've had to learn not to. And it's not easy, but it's how I've hung on to my sanity. I've just been able to go, okay, I'm moving on. Tomorrow's another day. That is a brilliant superpower. (laughs) Um, It works for the most. (laughs) (laughs) All right, last one. How many fucks do you give? None. You know, I, I I mean I do I care a lot about lots of things. I do give a fuck about how this government is treating this country. And you know, that makes me really angry. So, you know, in terms of how people view me, I I do care. I like to say I don't care, but I do care. And I think it's important sometimes to take on board when you're not getting things right. And all of us have moments in our life where we don't, and I'm no exception to that. <laughs> quite clearly (laughs) but yeah I do give a fuck I give a fuck about a lot of things thank you so much it's so lovely to see you I don't know when I last saw you but it's lovely to see you and thank you so much for asking me to do this Sam I'm really it's it's honestly a really great moment to have with you (laughs) thank you for listening you can hear a new episode of The Shift each Tuesday wherever you get your podcasts if you like what you hear please do rate, review and follow because it really does help other people find us. And if you'd like to support The Shift further, please consider becoming a member of our community. Find out more at steady.media forward slash The Shift.